I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Hardy, how are you today? I'm just fine, thank you. And you know what? What? I've got a riddle, and you won't guess. Oh, yes, I might. Maybe, uh, perhaps, uh, possibly. Are you ready? Ready. What two animals do you always go to bed with? Oh, that's easy. A teddy bear and a doll. No, that's not the answer. A doll isn't an animal, see? Oh, excuse me. Well, um, a teddy bear and nope. a... Nope. Hmm. Oh, all right, I give up. What two animals do you always go to bed with? Two calves? Yes, you have a calf on the back of each of your legs. Oh, so you have. You <laughs> tricked me, you fooled me, you hung me on a hook. <laughs> I knew I would, I knew I would. <laughs> now will you please read me the funny... Puck the comic yes. weekly. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. (whistles) Toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. (whistles) Beetle's hard-boiled sergeant looks at himself in the mirror. He sees his stomach is getting so big that it's hanging out over his belt. Oh, look at my stomach. I gotta cut down on eating. And a few minutes later, third picture top row, he's in the mess hall, giving the cook orders about what not to feed him. And under no circumstances are you to give me desserts. Understand? Well, okay, if you say so. Last picture top row, the cook is giving orders to Beetle and Bugsy, his two assistants. No matter what he says, don't give him any, or I get in trouble. Well, I hope he doesn't see your custard pie cookie. Bugsy looks at the sergeant and sees... No leg, they saw it. First picture, bottom row, the sergeant has a plate in his hand. His mouth waters. He's looking at Beetle. Beetle, uh, cut me a piece of that pie. No, sir. Please, just one little piece. No. The sergeant reaches for the pie. Beetle picks it up, and then begins to scuffle over the pie. Hey, come on down and tell you want that pie. You can't have it. Give me that pie. Give it to me. No, no, no. I order you. Cookie, tell him. Hey, for God's sakes, Bailey, let him have it. Nothing would make me happy. Hey, Bailey, I didn't mean give it to him in the face. Last picture, a happy sergeant is sitting at his desk, pie all over his face, and the captain exclaims, He hit you in the face with a pie? What are you going to do to him? Uh, how about the... Promoting him. <laughs> Isn't that funny? He gives orders to everybody not to feed him the pie, and he ends up ordering them to give it to him. Yes, and Beetle gave it to him right in the <laughs> face. Yeah, squished it right in his face. Oh, he looks funny. Yes. Well, now <laughs> let's see what's happening to the Walt Disney story, Ben and Me. Oh, yes, yeah, please. I just love the story about Amos. He's such a sweet little mouse. All right, then. Let's turn over the page and go past Little Iodine and Prince Valiant on page three. And here on page four is Ben and Me. You remember that Benjamin Franklin, who lived in the early days of America and was a very famous man, was experimenting with electricity. Yes, he put a little rod on the tip of a kite and then put Amos, the mouse, on a little box in the kite and had sent the kite flying up in the air. But a storm came up and lightning hit the kite and knocked the box apart, and Amos was hanging on for dear life. I wonder if Ben will get the kite down in time to save him. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Walt Disney's Ben and Me. Say the magic words with me. Hickory, dickory, diddly dee. Doodle some music for Ben and Me. Well, there I was, hanging on for dear life. It began to rain. Ben started to pull in the kite. The next thing I knew, I was on the ground. I was weak 
from the shop. I could hardly move. And I heard a voice that seemed to come from a great distance. Amos, Amos, speak to me. It was Ben. He was very worried. He picked me up in his hands. Amos, was it electricity? That did it. I leaped to my feet and opened my mouth. Electricity poured out in Ben's face. And I roared, was it electricity? Was it electricity? <laughs> and last picture top row, I turned on the heel of his thumb and crawled down, picked up my hat, and walked off. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Franklin. Goodbye, forever. <laughs> and so I returned to my family in the vestry of the old church on 2nd Street. Ben had discovered the nature of electricity, but he had lost my friendship. So, there we are, my family and me, tucked into bed, first picture bottom row. We always slept in shoes. We were the 65th cousins on my mother's uncle's sister's side of the old lady who lived in the shoe. We liked the old girl, so we sort of kept the habit. My mother believed in wisdom, so she had some of my original sayings tacked on the wall, like, uh, a stitch in time saves nine. A rolling stone gathers no more. Early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. And I was sitting there while everybody else slept, thinking up a new saying about that trickster Ben Franklin who had almost got me killed. The best I could think was, if you work for a genius or work for a dope, watch out for yourself or you've lost all hope. <laughs> followed were troubled ones. There was loud talk against the stamp taxes. Rumor of violence and rebellion. You see, we were still an English colony and the British king was taxing us unfairly. Meetings were held all over the state. And of course, I attended. How about it, men? Are we going to stand for this? No! No! Put down with the king! Naturally, I felt as strongly about the matter as the next man, or a mouse, and last picture, I climbed up on the lamppost and took charge of the meeting. I agree, man. And I say, no taxation without representation. Hooray! Hooray! Liberty forever! I'm sorry that friendship broke up because I liked Amos and Ben to be friends. Well, well, you know, as I recall, Ben Franklin was very active in the problems between the Americans and the British. And maybe now that Amos has joined those that are protesting against the English king... Maybe Ben and Amos will get together again, huh? Well, let's hope so. We'll find that out next week, I'm sure. Now let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, look, here on page six is Donald Duck. Read that, please. I won't waste a second. Here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squid a chicka chack. Let's have music to better quack quack. Today, Donald and his nephews, all dressed up in their Boy Scout clothes, are going out for a scouting trip. Donald is Scoutmaster. They're out in the backyard, all set to go. All right, line up for park inspection. Yes, sir, Uncle Donald. What else? Sir. Bad walls? Yes, sir. All wool. Cooking cuts? Yes, sir. Aluminum. Tough brushes? Yes, sir. And economy size toothpaste. And leave your compass home. This hike is to simulate emergency conditions. Sometime later, they're out in the woods. All right, now. This is where you learn to use substitute equipment. Out hatches. Hatches? Yes, hatchet. Last picture top row, Donald walks off, pointing at the trees. Blaze every fifth tree so we can find our way back. And remember, no compass. The boys out hatchet and begin to work blazing, which is putting a nick in every fifth tree. Ten minutes later, we see them hard at work, very unhappy. Oh, darn, this is hard work. Hey, wait, I have another idea. Yeah, what is it? Well, what we do is the first... Five minutes later, Donald, who is up ahead, notices that the hatchets have grown silent. He puts his hand to his mouth and... Ah! I don't hear the thunk of those hatchets! 
Last picture, Huey, Dewey, and Louie come toward him, carrying a tube of toothpaste. Behind them on the ground is a long cord of toothpaste. Huey says, That's okay, Uncle Donald. We're using substitute equipment. Yeah, a big wad of toothpaste on every fifth tree. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Zach clever. Putting toothpaste on the tree is much easier than chopping. Yes, but what'll happen if it rains and the toothpaste gets washed off? How would they ever find their way home then? Oh, I never thought of that. If they lost their way, then the markers would be washed off. Yes, that's why we use a hatchet, to make a little nick that'll oh. stay there. Oh, well, I guess the boys aren't so smart after all. <laughs> well, anyway, they're funny. Yes, anyway, they're funny. Well, now let's go to the last page of the first section and see what's happening in Dick's new adventure. All right. And here it is. You remember, Dick had a dream that he was going on a special mission with his uncle, who's a doctor, and, and General Wiley Thompson, who's an Indian agent. Yes, the United States government has been having trouble with an Indian chief named Osceola. So General Thompson has been sent to stop the trouble. And you remember last week, when they got to Florida, suddenly the stagecoach was stopped, and an Indian silently got in the stagecoach without saying a word. And Dick looked outside the coach and saw Indians surrounding them. And saw them right along with them. I wonder what that means. Are they captive? Well, let's read and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Riggedy pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Dick looks from the warriors who are riding along outside to the Indian who faces them in the stagecoach. And then the Indian speaks. My name is Powell, gentlemen. I'm half white man, but more than half Indian. Last picture, top row, General Thompson answers. So I see. I know you now. You're Osceola. Frankly, I'm glad you're here. It saves the United States government the trouble of looking for you. You're one of the few chiefs who are still defying us. The United States Congress has set aside thousands of acres west of the Mississippi just for the Indians. Now we are providing you with farm tools, medical care, and schools for your children. We'll pay you for your land in Florida. Now, why won't you accept our offer? Osceola's face hardens. We stop the coach now. He waves a hand. The Indians close their horses in on the stagecoach, and it is stopped. Get out. The door of the coach opens. And General Thompson, followed by Dick and his uncle, get out. Dick sees the anger mounting on Osceola's face as he says to General Thompson, White man has driven us far enough. Florida is our home. We mean to stay. Although he's surrounded by unfriendly Indians, General Thompson answers quietly. In that case, sir, you're under arrest. First picture bottom row, Dick sees the flash of a knife and throws himself on Osceola's arm to stop him from killing the general. But he's too weak. The Indians close in on them. Last picture, moments later, General Thompson is left buried under the wrecked stagecoach as Dick and his uncle, battered and bound up, are made captives. And then the little party rides southward. Oh, that Osceola was cruel. Yes, he was. I guess we can see now why the American government was having trouble with him. I wonder what will happen to Dick and his uncle. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. But now, look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, and I to see what's happening to Rusty because he is in very bad trouble. Well, I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the last page of the first section, Rusty Riley. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. An actor has stolen a valuable string of pearls from a wealthy girl named Miss Castle. He was dressed in Rusty's clothes. An electrician and a stage carpenter had seen the thief wearing Rusty's clothes. So naturally, they said that Rusty was a thief. However, Rusty was miles away from the theater at the time the pearls were stolen, helping a man named Jerry, whose truck was stuck in the mud. Mrs. Castle, mother of the girl, has brought charges against Rusty. He has been arrested, and a trial is now being held. 
Mr. Pringle, lawyer for Mrs. Castle, is calling the electrician and the carpenter to the stand to testify. Will Mr. Jake Wilson, the electrician, please take the witness chair? Mr. Tyndall, who is Rusty's lawyer, has a plan. He says to Rusty, Oh, uh, step into the next room, Rusty, and do just as I told you. Yes, sir. Second picture, the electrician is in the chair, and Mr. Pringle is cross-examining him. In your own words, Mr. Wilson, just what happened on the afternoon in question? Uh, <clears throat> well, sir, I was working right near the corridor where the dressing rooms are. I heard footsteps, so I took a look, knowing that the actors was all on stage. Well, I saw right off it was young Rusty Riley. You see, I did the electrical work at uh, Milestone Farm, so I know the kid well. No mistake in that jacket and the red cap. Last picture, top row, the carpenter was finishing his testimony. Well, I didn't see his face, but uh, recognized him as Rusty Riley. I seen the kid often. He was just opening Miss Castle's door. Then first picture, bottom row, Mr. Tyndall, Rusty's lawyer, comes forward. Uh, <clears throat> you two gentlemen are very positive about your identification of Rusty, in spite of the fact that you only had a back view. Now, I want you to pick Rusty from the two boys I'm about to show you. Officer, please open that door. The officer opens the door, and two persons of Rusty's height and weight are standing in the doorway, their backs to everyone in the room. Both boys are dressed exactly alike in Rusty's cap and Rusty's jacket. The electrician looks at the boys for a second, then points to one. Uh, the one on the right. That's Rusty, I'm sure. The carpenter nods. Yep, me too. He's the one on the right. Mr. Tyndall smiles. Thank you. That will be all, gentlemen. Will you boys turn around, please? The boys turn around, and Mr. Tyndall dramatically exclaims, Your Honor will please note that neither of these lads is Rusty. They are Dixie Wilkins and Mickey Dunn, professional jockeys. And Pringle rages. I object. This is nothing but trickery. They are carefully dressed in clothes exactly like Rusty Riley's. This does not prove that it was not Rusty who was seen at the theater. Meanwhile, only a few miles away on the highway, last picture, a car with a sign, Jerry's Wonder Dog, is speeding down the highway. In it are Stovepipe, Rusty's old friend. And Jerry, the man that Tex and Rusty have been hoping would appear. Jerry is the only man that knows that Rusty was not at the theater at the time the pearls were stolen. And Stovepipe is saying, Sorry I had to Shanghai you this way, Jerry, but a fine lad's future may depend on your testimony. And Jerry answers, Well, he helped me when I needed help bad, so I'm glad for the chance to help him. coming to tell everybody that Rusty didn't steal the pearls. And Tex and Mr. Tyndall's trick has worked. Wasn't that clever? Dressing those two jockeys just like Rusty and then asking that electrician, that carpenter, to point out which one was Rusty? Yes, and when the boys turned around, everybody in the room saw that neither one of them was Rusty. Mm. And that spoils Mr. Pringle's chance of proving that the carpenter's and the electrician's testimony is any good. Oh, I hope Rusty will get off next week. Well, we'll find out for sure. But now it's time to pick up the first page of the second section. Oh, yes. I wonder what funny thing Dagwood does today. Well, we'll find out right now. Here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Prime of food, I'm a thumb, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood's daughter, Cookie, has four friends, and they've all dropped in to ask her to go to the movies. Blondie is in the kitchen, quietly stirring up lunch. When suddenly, a tornado bursts into the kitchen. Mama! Mama, may I have 30 cents to go to the movies? Oh, you will have to ask Daddy. And out of the kitchen, Cookie goes. Last picture, top row. Dagwood is quietly relaxing in the bathtub. When suddenly... Quick, Daddy! Oh, no. <laughs> Quick, give me 30 cents for the movie. Don't scare me like that. <sighs> give me my pants. And Cookie dashes out of the room. Oh, my nerves, my poor nerves. First picture, second row, she's in again. Here's your pants. Quick, quick, quick. Take it easy, will quick. you? Look, you threw my pants in the water. Quick, quick, quick. Uh, 30 cents. Here and get out of here. Thank you, Daddy. And out she goes. Dagwood looks at his pants. Oh, my poor pants are so... (laughs) 
Last picture, second row. Cookie dashes down the hallway, trips over the dog. First picture, third row. She pats him on the head. Sorry, Pop, but you shouldn't get in the way when I'm in such a hurry. And down the stairs she goes. At the bottom stands Blondie, her arms full of dishes. Oh! Cookie, see what you've done. Smashed our best set of dishes. Sorry, Mom. And out the door she goes. Last picture, third row. Okay, kids. I'm all ready. Let's go. Yay! Yay! First picture, bottom row, Dagwood in his bathrobe looks at poor Blondie, who is lying on the floor, surrounded by broken dishes. Well, thank goodness. We'll have a few hours of peace around here to recover while they're at the movies. At the theater, the kids are looking at the announcement posted outside. Yeah, I've seen that picture. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I've seen it. So have I. Well, come on, kids. <laughs> Last picture, the door to the Bumstead house opens. And in gallop the children, and Cookie shouts... We all saw the movie, so we're coming back here to play. Oh, no. <laughs> what do you think of that? My goodness, she was certainly excited. Yes, do you throw your daddy's pants in the bathtub when you're excited? No, just his pocketbook. Hmm, and do you break a whole set of dishes when you're excited? No. Only the sugar bowl if it gets stuck around my hand when I'm getting the money out. Oh, you children. Well, I knew one thing I wouldn't do. What's that? If I've seen a movie and I liked it, I would go see it again, because I like the movie. Yes, I know a little girl named Phyllis who's just like that. And I know a boy named Stephen. <laughs> I guess most children are like that. Yes. Well, now let's turn over the page and... Oh, look, here's Flash Gordon. Oh, and Flash is on a strange planet investigating. Yes, he's the only Earthman there. And he's discovered many strange people who are ruled by a mysterious person who's never seen. But Flash has found some friends, too. An old hermit named Philo and a clown named Rosini. And they worked out a scheme so Flash could slip into the castle... But it didn't work. No, Flash slipped into the castle while Rosini was entertaining all of the soldiers and the mine. And suddenly, a trap door opened under Flash's feet and he fell down. I wonder what'll happen to him now. Well, let's find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga, riga, doon, doon, saskimatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. Flash falls through the trap door. As he falls, he hears... Finds himself at the bottom of a dark cavern in water up to his waist. Last picture, top row. Flash wades through the water. Oh, that laughing. All around me, splitting my head. First picture, bottom row. He works his way out of the water onto a slippery bank. Pitch black in here. Can't see a thing. I hope this portable searchlight still works. Last picture, he turns on his searchlight. It works. The cavern is flooded by its beam, a dank, dark place. And then Flash sees a mysterious creature that looks like an octopus across the cavern from him. And then an agonized scream echoes in his ears. What a- So am I. I wonder why it screamed when Flash turned on the light. Well, maybe the creature lives in the cave and can't stand the light. Oh, well, if that's the case, this could be Flash's way of defeating him. Yes, it could be. Oh, oh, do you think it could be? Well, we'll find out more about this next week. But now, look across the page. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes, and you remember that a man named Wasp Bascom has been blowing up cabins and stealing the stones because they have silver in them. Yes, but Roy finally captured him. And two of these men had captured a girl named Beverly Stark, and they were on their way to meet Watts Bascom. But they didn't know that Roy had already captured Bascom. Roy saw the men coming and was ready for them. Yes, and he Roy threw a, a keg of silent explosive into the wagon, just as it passed under the spot where Roy was hiding. And then the two outlaws jumped out of the wagon, leaving Miss Stark in it all alone. I wonder if she'll be safe. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip by you. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by you. <laughs> The lighted fuse lands in the wagon. Beverly Stark is terrified. Somebody help me. My legs are tied. And then Roy leaps from the bank above into the wagon. Don't worry, Miss Stark. It won't explode. What do you mean? I filled the keg with sand before tossing it into the wagon just to scare away Bascom's men. 
Meanwhile, the two outlaws who have scurried for cover wait for the explosion. Hey, why don't that explosive in the wagon go off? Uncover your ear flaps, knucklehead. It's noiseless. Maybe it's all over and we don't know it. Last picture, top row, cube root, gun in hand, appears before them. Correct, gentlemen. It is all over. Hey, what the? Roy Rogers already has captured your boss, Wasp Bascom. Now you are my prisoners. Crime does not pay. Short time later, second picture bottom row, Roy and Cube have delivered the outlaws to the sheriff, telling him the complete story of how the stolen stone buildings were built out of rock that contained silver. Well, Sheriff, I'll be riding on. Well, thanks for rounding up Bascom's gang, Roy. They'll be in cold storage for a long time. Right, Sheriff. Adios. Some miles away, a prison train transporting convicts to a new jail labors up a steep grade. Last picture, it passes under a low-hanging tree. A masked man, gun in hand, drops from the tree onto the caboose of the train. Yeah, there's one con on this rattler who won't reach that new prison. Come on, Sparrow, get ready to fly. Oh, goody, goody. Roy captured the crooks and he's turned them over to the sheriff. And they'll be locked up for a good long time, the sheriff said. But, uh-oh, there's going to be more trouble. I'm afraid you're right. That masked man on that train, which is loaded with convicts being taken to jail. Something tells me that Roy might be having a new adventure. Oh, I can't wait to see what it is. Well, we'll find out next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Connie Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and the honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. (laughs)